uh, welcome back. Thanks. And, and again, uh, Joan Nakasone, thanks for a, a great morning, uh, uh, two wonderful panels to, to, to get us uh, thinking about this very important topic. And just in case you were you had any doubts about the seriousness and the importance of this topic, the Army, uh, our next speaker obviously should dispel any such doubts. The fact that the, that the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army uh, carved out time to, to come speak on this topic to us conveys the importance that he personally and the Army institutionally uh, uh, pays to cyber. is a recognition of, of the, 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 the importance that the Army places on operations in the cyber domain. Uh, General Allen, you, you, as you all know, is, uh, is, is an officer who truly needs no introduction, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give one other than to say he was, he was very kind and consoling to me uh, just a few moments ago after a rough night uh, but as a lifetime Boston Red Sox fan, he understands the, the he understands the morning after. So thank you very much, Vice. Welcome to the podium. Thanks. Yeah, and what uh, what Carter didn't tell you is I started with a, I didn't come with a salt shaker to pour it in your wound, <laughs> because uh, those of you that may not follow baseball as closely uh, as we do. Um, he started off his run to the World Series by uh, knocking the Red Sox out in three games. So, um, and I only hope you don't have another 40 years to wait. You know, we went 86. You know, you, you, you've only been since 48. So uh, hopefully it's next year. But uh, I, uh, I wish uh, all of you well here today. It's great to see so many folks with us. And uh, I got to tell you, every time I come here, I am uh, consistently inspired by uh, both the talent and, uh, frankly, the, the breadth of uh, uh, the participants that join us in these forums. And I can only thank uh, General Ham, General Swan, and the entire AUSA extended team for uh, providing this forum where we can talk about important topics like what we're here to talk about today. And I do uh, note that I am not the only sleep-deprived member in the crowd here today. Uh, but uh, we got to say to the uh, Cubs and uh, Tribe fans across the country, uh, what an amazing World Series. How about a round of applause for those two great cities? Uh, forums like these drive worthwhile dialogue for our Army and for our nation. And we are all here because these discussions are hugely valuable for our future. The group assembled here today reaffirms AUSA's proven capacity to convene the brightest minds, current speaker excluded, of course, in addressing the most important topics facing our Army. General Ham, thanks for your leadership, and as always, it is great to see you. And I will uh, forgive you if you begin to nod, but everybody else, you, you got to hang in there with me. Uh, I'm going to try to energize you uh, through this afternoon and, and try to forget that was the wee hours of this morning before you uh, hit the hay before uh, heading in today. So thanks also to uh, our distinguished guests and to all the panelists that have joined us today uh, for what I know has been both a relevant, uh, timely, and will continue to be an insightful uh, set of discussions. This is a challenging time for our nation and certainly for our Army. The stable unipolar moment is over, and replacing it is a multipolar world characterized by competition. More and more people are leaving the country for the comforts of cities, increasing the demands on the state to provide basic necessities. Ongoing conflicts in places like Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan, combined with food and water shortage, shortages elsewhere, are driving cross-regional demographic changes. The resultant increase in refugees is fueling a backlash against so-called others and fomenting the rise of nationalism across the globe. At the same time, the rapid flow of information is creating new sources of wealth and for millions an improved standard of living while simultaneously expanding the gap between the haves and the have-nots. These sweeping changes impact how we man, train, equip, and organize our forces. 
We assess that all the factors I just mentioned will combine to make future battlefields extraordinarily complex, multi-domain environments. Like those of years past, they will include operations in the air and on the ground, most likely in congested and contested urban settings, but they will also be integrated with operations at sea, in space, and yes, in cyberspace. Into this environment, leaders of character will prove decisive. Men and women capable of commanding small, distributed formations against elusive and often ambiguous adversaries. Because of the brave soldiers who wear this uniform, I'm confident that our Army will fight and win wherever our nation asks, whenever our country calls. As leaders, it is our responsibility to ensure that when that call comes, and I'm confident it will, our soldiers have the right training, the right equipment, and the right leadership at every echelon to win. And that's why we're here today, to deliberately think through the challenges we face and act with foresight and relentless commitment to ensure our Army is ready for this uncertain future. This uncertain future will no doubt include and be influenced by myriad activities in cyberspace. This domain, the only man-made one that exists, creates a vexing set of challenges. For starters, it's difficult to describe, let alone to conceptualize. The most seasoned strategists have struggled with how to tackle this emerging battleground. The good news is, that we've made a great deal of progress and are determined to address the issues moving forward. Historically, cyberspace operations have been the exclusive domain of a small group of technical professionals. Looking forward, we will diverge from the days when cyberspace operations were the discrete responsibility of someone at Fort Meade towards one where cyberspace represents part of our common battlefield framework in the Army. Put succinctly, our ability to dominate cyberspace operations is inextricably linked to Army readiness. Today, I'll focus on three areas. First, I'll reaffirm that cyber threats and vulnerabilities impact everything from communications and logistics to operations and mission command. This is our new normal. And our future readiness demands both understanding and, most importantly, action to succeed amidst this new reality. Second, tactical cyber operational proficiency, that is, operations at the core level and below, are critical if we are to maintain our technological edge against our adversaries. And this must guide how we train and how we operate. Finally, Cyber readiness is critical to mission assurance. That is, the protection of our wartime equipment as well as our digital infrastructure. And this, frankly, is everyone's business, leaders and soldiers alike. It's an incumbent on all of us to protect our systems and ourselves against the pervasive cyber threats we face on a daily basis. As I said, cyber threats and vulnerabilities impact everything we do, and to adjust, we must act quickly, leveraging agile personnel, training, and acquisition processes to adapt to new circumstances. Recognizing the importance of the, this issue, the Army has worked in earnest to develop solutions. General Creighton Abrams once said, people aren't in the Army, People are the Army, and in that spirit, we established a separate branch specifically for our cyber, cyber operations forces. The Army's first new branch since we established Special Forces in 1987. From an initial start of six officers in 2014, we have grown our cyber branch, Career Field 17, and today we have 397 officers, 141 warrant officers, and 560 non-commissioned officers and soldiers across the force. And our Army is on track, fielding our cyber mission force, from 41 teams today to eventually a full fill of 62 total force teams, 
so that our joint force can maintain free freedom of maneuver and dominate cyberspace. These forces are fully engaged, and the speed with which they deliver results speaks to the urgency of the cyber threat and their persistence and commitment to succeed. We've coupled our recruitment effort with a wide breadth of training and professional military education. We've fundamentally changed our institutional capacity and processes to support cyber force recruitment, training, education, and career development. Standing up our cyber school in 2014, we graduated 21 officers from the Cyber Basic Officer Leadership course this year and are on track to exceed this number in 2017. Other PME courses take place every day, officer, warrant officer, and non-commissioned officer. Most importantly, the first Cyber Operations Specialist Advanced Individual Training course will begin in March of this year. This year, more than 300 soldiers will graduate from Cyber Center of Excellence courses, a number that will likely double in the coming year. Importantly, every graduate is trained to joint and cryptologic standards because cyberspace is inherently joint. We continue to pursue innovative solutions that will responsibly support our warfighters. Working with departmental leadership, the Army is pursuing accelerated delivery times for cyber capabilities as well as formal programs of record. The majority of our effort focuses on offensive and defensive cyber capabilities across infrastructure, platforms, and software tools, and we are all leveraging rapid acquisition processes as we move forward. Things like other transaction authority to procure, procure defensive cyber tools for our cyber protection teams in theater so they can actively map and protect our diverse networks and in the event of attack, conduct initial forensics on site. We're also pursuing infrastructure solutions compatible with WinT to provide tactical reachback support from home. Finally, we're pursuing software that will help analyze networks and threats further strengthening our defenses and mitigating our vulnerabilities. Key to all of our efforts is rapid development and, more importantly, rapid fielding. Second, we must look for opportunities to integrate cyber capabilities at tactical echelons in support of joint and combined land operations. Initially, we're focused on our brigade combat teams, and we've placed two cyberspace officers and brigade combat team staffs during two national training center rotations and one joint readiness training center rotation as part of our cyber support for core and below pilot program. And results have been extremely positive. For example, the 1st Armor Brigade combat team of the 1st Infantry Division used cyberspace officers to execute an integrated offensive cyber and electronic warfare attack, and leveraging these individuals' unique capabilities, conducted a strong network defense against cyber attack during their recent July NTC rotation. Other BCTs, including 3rd Brigade of the 25th Infantry Division and 1st Brigade of the 82nd Airborne Division, experienced similar results. Looking ahead, we must also view every training event including joint and combined operations, as opportunities for integrated cyberspace and electronic warfare operations. The network is a warfighting platform. It enables kinetic and non-kinetic operation and demands intelligence, planning, maneuver, and leadership. In the future, we will fight routinely against cyber-enabled adversaries. Therefore, we must take every opportunity to integrate cyberspace and electronic warfare operations into our tactical planning cycles. Numerous obstacles remain. For example, the lack of bilateral and multilateral agreements create interoperability challenges with our multinational partners, and Federal Aviation Administration restrictions make it exceedingly difficult to routinely train in a contested electromagnetic environment. These are just two examples.
Nevertheless, we must overcome existing policy and legal restrictions so that our soldiers can fully exploit cyber and EW capabilities while applying routine force protection in order to excel in the multi-domain environment in which we operate today and will operate in the future. Finally, cyber readiness is now a crucial component of Army strategic readiness and critical to mission assurance. That is the protection of our wartime equipment as well as our digital infrastructure. Our military, like society, operates on a network of systems. Virtually everything we own and operate, from our handheld global positioning systems, cell phones and computers, to Apache helicopters, unmanned aerial vehicles, and multiple launch rocket so system software, are connected to networks. This means they are vulnerable to attack. Army networks are under constant threat from nation states, criminals, and others. The Department of Defense estimates its networks are probed millions of times every month, looking for that weak link. Commanders and soldiers must know their key cyber terrain, understand the risk at each level, where essential data resides, and take necessary steps to reduce the threat. Therefore, part of mission assurance is simply embracing a culture of cyber security. A leading cyber security firm noted that 91% of incidents they responded to in the past year were the direct result of operator error, mostly spear phishing. Gone are the days when cyber was done by a small cadre of technical experts. Today, every soldier is a cyber warrior. And that means that every one of us must understand how the cyber domain impacts ourselves and our operations, both offensively and defensively, and how to reduce our vulnerabilities. This business is tough because, frankly, we are waging a cyber war every day while concurrently building the force and infrastructure to accomplish current and future missions, something we've got increasingly good at over the last decade and a half. Cyberspace operations, though, piercing through a virtual domain, start first with people. Therefore, our guiding principle, our lodestar for Army cyberspace operations, must be on developing leaders of character. Here, our Army is on the right track. The young soldiers, non-commissioned officers and officers operating across our force are resilient, adaptable, and capable of leading through this change. The story of Staff Sergeant Matthew Decker, an Army Reserve flight medic, illustrates the point and the reason that cyber readiness is so important. One morning last September, Staff Sergeant Decker was awoken in Afghanistan and notified that American troops were in contact. A Special Forces A team advising local security forces was in an intense firefight. Soon, Staff Sergeant Decker's headquarters received a nine-line medevac request, and he departed in a UH-60 Blackhawk. Upon the medevac's arrival, the A team and their partner forces were nearly surrounded and engaged in a heavy firefight. The volume of fire was so intense that the pilot crash landed after clipping the rotor blades on a nearby building. Staff Sergeant Decker, upon exiting, rendered aid to a soldier who had sustained a gunshot wound through his thigh. The wounded soldier had lost so much blood that Staff Sergeant Decker didn't know whether he would survive, let alone keep his leg. He treated his patient amidst the chaos of small arms, artillery, and AC-130 gunship fire. After nearly 18 hours on the ground, U.S. forces were running low on ammo. The good news was that after a blood transfusion and multiple tourniquets, Staff Sergeant Decker's patient was stabilized. Shortly thereafter, four Chinooks arrived to evacuate all the soldiers, and including our wounded. Staff Sergeant Decker recently notified us that the wounded soldier is doing great. He recently ran two miles in just over 16 minutes and should be back on jump status soon. 
Thanks to Staff Sergeant Decker and the swift response of that medevac, he retains both his legs. The vignette I just shared described a place, that, a location in Afghanistan in the town of Marja, to be exact, a place where the Taliban is strong, but one where we enjoy information dominance in the cyberspace domain. But consider what the outcome might have been had a regional adversary, one with significant cyberspace and electronic warfare capabilities, challenged our cyberspace superiority. For example, an enemy attack on our communications network would have prevented the nine-line medevac from being relayed in a timely manner. Or worse, manipulated the data in a way that caused responders to go to the wrong place or with the wrong equipment. Enemy electronic warfare operations could jam GPS signals, making identification of friendly troops on the objective nearly impossible. And an electromagnetic attack against our helicopters onboard software could cause a catastrophic crash. We've already seen the impact of Russian cyber and electronic warfare operations in the Ukraine. Going forward, these are the considerations that will guide our preparation for future battlefields. So as we continue our cyber discussions, focus first on soldiers and their missions. In the current operational environment, cyber capabilities are easily copied or countered. What gives the United States Army a comparative advantage over our adversaries is our skilled soldiers and our well-trained teams who optimize all of their assets across all domains to achieve mission success. It's all about the soldier. Lieutenant General Nakasone and his team understand all this, and I'm glad you're here today with us, Paul. You are a seasoned cyber warrior. Thanks for your continued leadership on behalf of our Army. Our soldiers are counting on you and those who work for you, and we know that you will sustain Army, Army Cyber Force momentum in support of the Joint Force. Before I open it up for questions, I'll leave you with two guiding thoughts. First, our Army has led through change before, and the challenges facing us today can be overcome with positive, innovative leaders of character at every echelon. Second, we're the greatest Army in the world, and we're committed to remaining the best for years to come. We will do so by operating it as a team, a total force, partnered with the great patriots like those of you in the audience. Thanks again. God bless you, and Army strong. And no, I don't know why they decided to pitch, uh, you know, the reliever Chapman in the sixth game. I'm sure that was your uh, first question. Baseball is more for poor bases, right? <laughs> no, all, all, all my all my sports no, brain power has been driven down by things like turret ring diameters and so forth. Uh, uh, question: you, you touched on both, you know, things that are you know considered over in the cyber basket, but also things that are considered in the EW basket. The Army's been trying very hard to merge the two, to join them together in SEMA. Uh, but, you know, while we're trying to acquire cyber tools rapidly, you know, we have a very slow timeline to, to build actually new EW tools, uh, which often require more of a capital investment. And there's certainly a lot of anxiety among some, you know, longtime EW folks that, you know, they're going to be the, 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 the tail and cyber the dog in the new combined effort. Uh, if you could address that concern and those timelines. Um, well, obviously, it's a, it's a valid concern anytime you talk about uh, uh, traditional programs of record and the speed with which we're able to field capability. So we're going after rapid acquisition uh, um, through both our authorities and the authorities uh, uh, at the uh, Department of Defense in both cyber electronic warfare and all war fighting uh, capability gaps that uh, that we need to address. So uh, th there is not a uh, over prioritization of one over the other. It's a matter of uh, as we look at the future battlefield and the adversaries that we're likely to go up against, what are the gaps and how quickly can we close them? Hey, General Allen, the um 
Secretary Carter's been talking about lateral accession lately and bringing people in at different levels. And I'm wondering if cyber is not a place where that might be applied. Uh, we're fighting over the same skills and same skilled people in a lot of cases between industry and academia and uh, in the government. And I was just curious in your thoughts as to whether you saw any benefits in that and whether that's something we might see in the future. Yeah, the uh, ability to laterally assess uh, skilled professionals is something that we do already in the Army in some of our uh, skills. Um, medical is one that is, is widely uh, understood, uh, but we have uh, recognized that this has applicability in uh, specialty fields like cyber, and uh, that, uh, that is being uh, uh, matured and developed as an option for the chief and the secretary. And uh, it was clearly identified as part of our force of the future analysis uh, that we went through this past year. And uh, not only will we have to apply um, new accession tools, but we're going to have to also consider um, how do you retain this incredible talent. Uh, now, the good news is for our cyber professionals, they can do things in defense of our nation that they would get arrested for uh, on, on the outside world. And so that is very attractive uh, to those who uh, uh, are very, very skilled and committed to the security of our country. And uh, for that, we, uh, we are thankful for their, both their skill, uh, but uh, as importantly, for their desire to continue to serve and protect our country. Sir, a uh, question on, you mentioned earlier about um, we're growing our cyber defense force, right? And so that's kind of uh, starting. Relatively speaking, what, what is the state of either our adversaries or allies out in the world relative to their defense forces? How much are they investing in the cyber realm? Um, and are, are you seeing those like maybe China, Russia, maybe uh, leading on some of the cyber uh, initiatives and, and making integrating that part of their defense? And do you understand my question, sir? Uh, I think I understand where you're going. I'm not going to, given the classification of our present environment, I'm not going to get into specific details. But um, I, I would say we we know the capability of our adversaries. Um, we know uh, the skill with which they operate. And in many cases, they are uh, less hindered by uh, legal considerations uh, that, uh, that we adhere to. Um, and uh, w we can only suspect uh, that uh, if they have a capability uh, uh, on the attack, that they are also factoring the need to defend uh, and uh, therefore are preparing their own defenses accordingly. Um, but uh, that's about as much as I'll, I'll say in, in, in this fora. But I'm sure that General Nacholsoni will take you to a dark room and have a deeper conversation. <laughs> General Allen, what would you say to soldiers who may be interested in cyber careers but maybe hesitate because they're not sure if they have the skills required for that? Uh, how would you encourage them? Um, well, I would uh, tell them that uh, Second Lieutenant Allen didn't think he had the skill to, to uh, necessarily make it in the United States Army when he first joined, and I'm sure glad that I took the step uh, and have enabled uh, those around me to train me into being uh, a professional. And the great thing about our profession is that uh, uh, we train everybody to exceed their potential. And for those that are interested in a profession that cares for its own, that is committed to the security of our country, uh, there is no better place than to join the United States Army and to be a cyber professional who is uh, committed every day to ensuring not only our protection uh, but to offset the uh, desires of our adversaries. Sir, Jeff Proch, retired soldier. Thanks for your, your comments today. Soldier for life, I think, is what I heard you say. Roger that. <laughs> uh, I had a chance to go to an industry cyber breakfast recently where your counterpart from the Navy, Vice CNO Howard, was talking about the same concerns uh, in the Navy. And in fact, uh, the real vulnerability of the shore community, their installation community, the key vital facilities, because 
the shore community has been the bill payer for keeping up readiness and training, you know, for the fleet, the aviation, much like the Army is. She, in fact, said, you know, I think it's probably going to take a cyber Pearl Harbor to get us the funding and get the attention of the people, you know, in, in town here. Uh, you, you think she's on to something there, General? Um, well, I, uh, I certainly hope we, uh, we don't wait for uh, that kind of an impact. Um, but uh, clearly, uh, uh, additional resources would be helpful. Uh, but uh, it's a balancing act. Uh, I think the most important thing that we're focused on right now is um, the fact that, as you heard me say, with, with uh, 90 percent or greater of the threat being at the individual level, is training our soldiers to be as vigilant operating their equipment uh, as they are when they uh, get into a combat patrol. And uh, the vigilance of our soldiers 24-7 uh, will significantly reduce the vulnerabilities that we have um, as we continue to invest in some of the hardware and equipment uh, solutions that, that are going to be necessary going forward. So uh, I believe we've, we've focused our commanders. Uh, ultimately, when the commanders have the right focus, uh, our Army moves forward in a coherent, synchronized way. And uh, they are focused on this problem. And uh, now it's a matter of following through on both the training and accountability of each and every soldier to fulfill their responsibility. Sir, on the retention piece, I saw a study recently that suggested that once you get past a certain threshold of pay and benefits, that pay and benefits are not the primary motivators for people working in information security. In fact, one of those motivators was being able to progress without necessarily getting pigeonholed into management. <laughs> Is there a plan to perhaps incorporate that into the military ranks to be able to progress up the ranks without necessarily becoming a first sergeant or a commander for the rest of your career? Dang. <laughs> if you told our first sergeants and commanders that they were pigeonholed, I think you'd be in for a scrap. Uh, that's not exactly how they see their responsibilities, but uh, I do understand your question. And uh, I think one of the key conversations that we've had, really starting with uh, General Odierno and continuing with General Milley, is what does career progression in the cyber domain uh, in the cyber field look like? You know, the typ typical uh, prog progression in the Army and most of our fields uh, looks like a pyramid, right? Lots of people at the lower ranks getting very small as you go up, right? Um, we know that our cyber force needs to look differently. Right, um, it's going to have sort of a bulge in the middle, and the question is, what is the sweet spot for that bulge that enables our gifted, talented professionals who want to continue to operate in that domain uh, that they can continue to do so and be properly compensated? So we have a number of, uh, I, I would say, at this point, maturing thoughts on this, and uh, we've got you know, some work underway to, to try to get some, uh, something more than instinct uh, behind it to, to assess whether or not uh, we're on the right path here. But y you, are, you are correct in saying that there are people out there, much like in aviation, frankly, that, you know, if you tell them they, they got to take their hand off the stick and stop flying, they're going to leave, right? And so we have ways to retain our you know, warrant officer professionals to very senior levels uh, while they continue to fly our aircraft and uh, season us with their incredible experience and expertise. And I suspect we'll be able to do something similar for our cyber warriors as well. Uh, General Todd Lopez with Army News Service. You, you talked about cyber being a role for all soldiers. What will be the role of the most junior soldiers at the lowest levels of infantry and otherwise, uh, both offensively and defensively, and how will Army training, their Army training, uh, be affected and be reflected in that? Yeah, I think uh, the number one is this, uh, this culture of vigilance, right? And uh, as much as I, it pains me to say it, you just can't trust uh, every uh, social interaction that comes your way 
uh, through the, the internet and cyberspace, right? So you, you gotta be vigilant, you gotta recognize that uh, some of those requests that come your way are not what they appear to be, um, and you gotta uh, be disciplined enough to uh, follow the right procedures when you get the, the phishing attacks, you get the, uh, the attempts to penetrate uh, through the you know, uh, naive response of somebody who might not be thinking that people have evil intentions, right? And uh, uh, frankly, in some respects, this also gets into operational security. You know, what, what do you communicate? How do you prevent our adversaries from getting information, protected information, uh, from uh, uh, domains where they're comfortable interacting uh, on, a, on a daily basis? It also means, uh, you know, being disciplined about, you know, when you're operating on a computer, um, you know, uh, logging off and ensuring that you're using the appropriate protocols uh, every time you access your computer, whether that's remotely or uh, directly at the keyboard. Uh, so most of the, the skills and vigilance we expect from our soldiers is, is foundational. Um, but it's also not necessarily routinely practiced um, before they enter the service. So we're, we're having to retrain a culture of disciplined vigilance uh, in doing so in a manner that makes them understand it's not about restricting your liberties or your freedoms, it's about protecting our force and ensuring that, uh, that we don't give our adversaries a weak point of entry. How'd I do there, Paul, was that okay? All right. Paul's Steve, grading my homework here. Stephen Brewster, uh, Johnson Controls. Um, a part of mission insurance and the readiness and the uh, operational readiness, uh, there's a, a significant portion that falls on the infrastructure, energy management, utilities. Um, one of the things I've seen is that cyber warrior and that training isn't uh, uh, well-founded amongst some of the individuals in that particular sector. So what kind of plans are there to try to spread that same capability, awareness, and training to some of these other agencies that don't have a strong cyber force? Well, I, I think there's a great interagency dialogue uh, on, this, uh, on this topic, both uh, f from a um, uh, reduction of vulnerabilities and a uh, posturing uh, every possible member of the team to present a strong defense. So um, I think one of the great challenges that we face, frankly, is that uh, our policy and our procedures have not necessarily caught up with the environment we find ourselves in every day. And uh, so, so there's a lot of uh, uh, plowing, harrowing, seeding, and growing that has to be done uh, and uh, we certainly will continue to contribute to that dialogue and uh, um, we'll try to uh, help our teammates uh, where we can uh, when, we, when we assess uh, vulnerabilities that we identify in our uh, infrastructure that may be applicable to them as well. Hi, Courtney McBride with Inside the Army. Uh, General Allen, given the, the very challenging resource environment the Army finds itself in now and the broad implications for cyber and EW across Army platforms, are you finding yourself having to make difficult trades in, in prioritizing cyber and EW um, over or you know, to the exclusion of other, other capabilities or priorities? Well, uh, frankly, uh, and thanks, Courtney, but it, it is all about priorities. And, uh, you know, this is, this is in the... Uh, top priority category uh, for the chief and the secretary. The fact that we've been growing our cyber force at a time when the rest of our army is getting smaller um, ought to tell you how serious we are about it. Um, you know, you vote first with your people, right? And we're p putting our best people at this and uh, increasing uh, capacity in this realm. Uh, and uh, we will not only continue to assess them, uh, train them, uh, but we will also equip them uh, as needed to, to dominate in this environment. I think the biggest area for us, uh, as was highlighted, uh, I think, in the first, uh, first question here, is uh, in the realm of electronic warfare, an area that we have um, uh, organizationally aligned at echelons above core uh, capability as opposed to being integrated uh, 
inside all of our tactical formations. And so that's, that's the area that we are most aggressively working uh, to change our stance. Uh, and we will ensure that the resources align as required. Hello, I'm Kyle Gasway of Talk Media News. Um, there's been a growing interest in drones and AI technology these days, especially with uh, public interest. Um, I was hoping to get your comments or your thoughts where you see this technology going uh, in the future and its impact. Thank you. Well, artificial intelligence and uh, unmanned uh, capabilities are going to be a part of our, our future force. Uh, they're going to increasingly um, influence uh, both how we operate and how we organize for combat. And uh, we've got a significant amount of work going after the specifics of how we uh, best optimize our capabilities uh, in both of those domains. Uh, I think uh, you're well aware of the, the great work we're doing with manned and unmanned teaming, uh, integrating the capability of our manned uh, Army aviation with uh, unmanned uh, aerial vehicles and uh, the work that that has, uh, or the capability extension and range and capacity that's given to our formations, both in the training and the combat environment. Um, that that is the you know the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's possible, and uh, we recognize that uh, uh, we, we are going to have uh, increased contributions by unmanned systems in virtually every aspect of how we currently uh, conduct business. And uh, we're open to taking that as far as it can go uh, to ensure that uh, we're, uh, we're leveraging uh, our soldiers to their best and enabling them as best we can with unmanned systems. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Tito will return next year. Uh, you, you mentioned that the, 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 uh, the cyber domain is an inherently joint domain. Uh, conversations about it, uh, do you see in the future uh, increasing uh, joint training, joint professional development, rather than the service-specific approach in exactly? Well, I, I think uh, if you ask uh, Paul, Paul just spent a couple of years over there on the joint side of what we're doing with cyber, and it's exactly that type of collaboration and teamwork that will continue. And we are leveraging both uh, Army uh, programs of instruction and joint uh, programs of instruction as part of the uh, development and training and education of our cyber force, and that will uh, continue to be the case. And I think we'll find given that uh, we've established a, uh, a pretty robust center of excellence uh, that we will probably, as we do in many other uh, supporting roles for the Joint Force, uh, provide much of our uh, training and education for the Joint Cyber Force, not just the Army Cyber Force as we move forward. Okay. Well, when All I right. had the, the privilege of serving with, uh, with General Allen on the Joint Staff, uh, and he was the Joint Operations Director at uh, uh, Lima, but his, his motto was roll well and live, right? <laughs> Which is, I think they, you've applied that now to the Army staff, roll well and live. I, I should tell you the truth in, in lending. General Nakasone said if the vice would just give him the people and the resources he needs, he could accomplish all these things. <laughs> You're in really good company there, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mike, thank you very, very much for sharing oh. your